Thank you, Lord. Well, we had a special morning. Get back to my notes. You know, it says in the, in the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter and verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Say that with me. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, what a tremendous comfort to know that God is constant. You know, John's gospel, or the epistle of John, the, you know, that the God is a light shining in the darkness. And the Bible says there's no variableness in him. You know, his, his, his light doesn't get dimmer. He's the same all the time. You know, we live in a time of, uh, of great skepticism, a time of doubt. And even in the church world, uh, people are reluctant to believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so many times we pray for people and we're just being polite. And, and thank God for polite people. Can you say amen? Yeah, for real. We, we want to do the right thing, you know. And it's easy to pray for somebody on Facebook and hit like. And I don't know, we really prayed, but we liked it. And, and we told them we cared, right? Told them we cared. But the truth is, is that uh, God is the same. And people praying and people caring really does make a difference. I'm going to invite uh, at this time uh, uh, Tony and Boulder McKinney to come up. And we all know that uh, uh, Tony has now fought a couple of battles with cancer. And, but they've, just, uh, they've got an extraordinary report. They sent me a text uh, Friday morning as they were uh, headed home. And uh, would you give a hand as uh, Tony and Boulder come to share this morning? Thank you. Um, we are blessed to be here this morning. Um, the other night we were eating dinner with my son, uh, Hunter, or I guess our son. Did I say our son or my son? <laughs> okay. Uh, we were at Lambert's in Ozark, and uh, there was a, a school that was having a class trip, and they all had matching shirts on, and they had a quote on the back, and Tony saw it, and she's like, what is that quote? And it was a quote by Mike Tyson, and you don't see too many quotes from Mike Tyson <laughs> on t-shirts, uh, but it says, it said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Um, three years ago this month, we got punched in the face um, when Tony was diagnosed with stage three breast and stage four bone cancer. Um, if you know our family, uh, we're kind of slightly average ordinary Oklahoma Sooner fans um, and it was at the time that she was diagnosed that their softball team was playing in their conference championship uh, tournament and we kept seeing these shirts that said battle and um, and signs and they would hold up the number four whenever they would make a big play and and so I kind of researched it and I found out that uh, it came from the team's Bible study. They were studying about uh, different battles in the Bible. And their team captain came up with battle and it stands for boast about the Lord. And it's from 2 Corinthians 10, 17. And the number four that they would hold up meant that they were, they were playing four and they were battling for their teammates and playing for the Lord. Amen. And, and we got to meet her and her family and we shared our story and uh, we've been blessed uh, to become really good friends with them. But we immediately adopted this battle uh, whenever she uh, was first diagnosed um, and for her battle with cancer. And we were going to boast about the Lord no matter what happened. Uh, and we were going to battle for my wife. We thanked him for all the blessings uh, that he had given us. And even before she had her first treatment, um, we were thanking him for fully healing her. And it's not easy to do when you see your wife in pain day in and day out and losing weight and just doesn't have the energy to get up. And tomorrow will be our 24th wedding anniversary. Amen. And, and these, 
These last three years have been the toughest by far, but the faith and the fight and the toughness that she has shown in these three years has just shown me how blessed I am to have her as my wife. Amen. Well, um, like you said, it was um, stage three breast and stage four bone, but um, God, uh, God healed me um, from ba- that. But in um, January this year, um, we found out that the cancer was back. And it was in my liver and my spine in the bone, and it was stage four. And we went through many tests and scans in Springfield. We actually also, um, Boulder took me down to Texas to MD Anderson. And um, all the tests, and you guys, I mean, you know, Mika, Shelly, you've been through this, all the tests that you go through (laughs) um, to do this, all of them and all my doctors there down in in Springfield and in um, Texas confirmed that, yes, it was stage four cancer. Um, When my oncologist said, um, when he was talking to me, my oncologist, he said, this is an incurable cancer that you have. It is incurable. I immediately replied to him and said, my God can cure the incurable. So so this is the scan, I think, um, this is the scan of back in January. And if you can see there, there, um, all that black except for like at the top where my, um, or I guess he's got the pointer over here, whatever. <laughs> um, the top is my brain and then my heart and my bladder. Those are my organs. They will always show up black on this. It's called a PET scan. But all of that black in there is cancer. And that's what, and my doctor used the phrase um, that I was infested with it. I was infested with cancer. So you can see it was, um, the cancer had come back with a vengeance. Um, This round was so hard on me, you know, just with the sickness and pain, it was hard to walk, it was hard to move. But I knew that my God could heal me again. Um, It was sometimes hard to keep my spirit up at times, feeling so miserable, but I just kept feeding my spirit with healing scriptures. I'd, you know, play a CD with scriptures as I'd go to bed. I'd, you know, I have like this book of scriptures that I would just read out loud and just feed my spirit. Um, And I I also knew that people were praying for me, and I appreciated that so much. Uh, Wednesday, I had another PET scan and met with a doctor on Thursday. My doctor, from seeing some of the tests from MD Anderson, uh, knew that the treatments were working and some of the tumors had shrunk. And he was expecting some improvement, um, but he wasn't expecting this. So, So the black is just my organs. I am completely cleared and healed. And I immediately, when I saw that scan, I looked at my doctor and I said, see what my God did. My God did that. Yeah. So it is, it is gone. It is clear. And my doctor was amazed. I mean, he was amazed. You know, and I can even tell some of the people in the, in the office, like his nurse and stuff, they were so excited, they were amazed too. So I knew that, you know, they were spreading the good news among their co-workers there because everybody had smiles on their faces there. Um, you know, God, and I just want to say thank you again for ones that I know that many of you were praying for me. God heard you, God listened, and he answered your prayers. And I, I got my miracle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, just want, I just want to end with, please still keep me in your prayers. I know I'm healed. My doctors still want to keep me on some of the treatments just for preventative purposes. And I'm okay with this because I know that my God, you know, that God is working through the doctors. 
Um, thank you everyone that prayed for me. Thank you for those that gave us special gifts um, to help us through this battle. Um, we serve an awesome God and we give him all the glory. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, the appropriate thing is let's stand and thank the Lord. Amen. Father, we just thank you for everything that you do. You do exceedingly and abundantly above we might ask or think. We're thankful, Father God, that often you look down from heaven and you, with your compassion, you reach out and you touch us. And we're just so grateful, Father. We believe that this morning, Father, even as people are listening online, that the testimony will encourage them concerning your faithfulness, that you're not done, uh, that you're still a very present help in our lives. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yes, give the Lord another hand. Amen. Listen, I want to thank, I, I know that Tony and Boulder have many friends here this morning and family. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting them and loving on them. And, and uh, uh, you know, you, you, the Bible says we bear one another's burdens. We weep with those that weep, and sometimes we do that. But we also get to rejoice with those that rejoice. And we certainly are rejoicing this morning. I'd like to share, and again, I realize many of you are guests, but as a pastor, I've, you know, I've got concerns about things that could be impacting people's lives. And again, we live in a day of great skepticism. Uh, I failed to make my weekly commercial, and if you'll just allow me to pause for just a second. If you're listening online, we appreciate your being there. If you'll let us know that you're there, if you'll like it, if you'll love it, if you share it. If you've got a question, we'll get back with you uh, after the after the service, if you, you, know, you can post a prayer request, or you can message us privately. We asked our church family. This is a great testimony. It'd be a great thing. My message is, is, is certainly, uh, we're making this just part of the message, is going to complement uh, what Tony had to, and Boulder had to share today. And so uh, we're, we're doing this, uh, this series, Following God Through, you know, through Chaos and, and Conflict. In confusion. And so this morning I will just deal primarily with the term confusion. There would be a lot of confusion in the church world concerning whether or not that God is still in the business of intervening in people's lives. Does he still do the miraculous when people pray? Uh, can believers still lay hands on the sick and they recover? Does the prayer of faith save the sick? Now, this doesn't always have to do with that, but you know, we have many times in our lives that we need God's intervention. There would be no other way, there would be no other hope unless that the Lord would come in and intervene into our lives. And so with that thought in mind, uh, uh, we're going to address the question, uh, has the miraculous ended? Believing that God, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that it was true in the epistles that Jesus went from town to town, said teaching and preaching the gospel, healing all manner of sickness and disease. But then you find a continuation of that throughout the, the book of Acts. But there are many today that just believe that, uh, you know, they love God. All right, I'm... I'm I'm going to make a case here. They love God. I believe that there are brothers and sisters. I believe they're going to heaven. But I believe that much of what they teach robs people of hope. So I'm going to answer this question. Has God ceased doing the miraculous? The word cessation all right, means this. The fact or the process of ending or being brought to an end. There is a large faction in the body of Christ. They would, you know, they would, they would ascribe. They're, they're public about it. They're not only public about it, but they're evangelistic about it. And again, let me say this. Uh, there are brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we get to heaven, we're all going to be there together. 
But my concern as a pastor, again, and I, you know, I, I try to pay attention. Now, I'm not a guy. Uh, somebody asked me yesterday. Was it yesterday? might have been Friday. They said, well, why are you teaching this? So I said, well, listen, I, I'm online, and I see, I see what the most prominent people online are saying. And they're saying that signs and wonders, that mighty deeds passed away. They've ceased. They refer to themselves as cessationists. They are bright people. Their videos are well made. They have, they have, they have filled TikTok with their message. So I know that our young people are seeing this. They're all over Facebook. They're all over YouTube. And again, they're bright people. Uh, many of them uh, uh, are, are quite scholarly. You could be scholarly and not biblically correct. We often, as, as people of faith, we can find ourselves blind by our biases. I've been blinded by bias in my life. I want to always be in a position where I'm, I'm flexible, that I'm open to growth, that I'm open to, to God changing my life. And as you can see to this morning by the testimony of Tony and Boulder, that obviously that healing has not ended. It is not a, it is not a process that God is no longer involved in because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I can't answer everything. Anybody who thinks they have the answer to everything is, is just not being honest with themselves. The only one who knows everything is, is God. You know, it says that in Numbers, it says that the secret thing belongeth to the Lord. I can't tell you why that God intervened in Tony's life and the first time and she was healed. And then it came back. Now, I've, you know, I've, I don't want to say that I'm clueless, but I'll tell you this. You live in a fallen world. If you eat, you get hungry again. Am I right? You've been offended, and you get offended again. Am I right? We live in a fallen world. We do. And, and, and I'm not the one who says, as, well, gosh, you know, somebody got sick, they must have sinned. No, I'm, I, I wouldn't teach that at all. And I, I think that there are rare cases in the Bible where Jesus, did, you know, said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Rise, take up thy bed and walk. There could be a rare case where somebody sinned and as a result, they opened the door to the enemy. I, that, I, I, I would give some credence to that, but that's not the everyday thing that happens. We live in a world that's fallen, that's broken. Everything within us fights sickness. Why more people of faith are no more, aren't more starwart, stronger in believing God for healing, for intervention, for answering their prayers is often quite a shock to me because again, I find people say, well, you know, the Lord gave me cancer. He gave me cancer. And I learned X, Y, and Z. And listen, you're going to learn something in everything that happens in life. Yeah. You, you should. You, you know, I, I've learned things through every good decision I've made, and I've learned things through every bad decision I made. And do you know when God's plan wasn't for my bad decisions? He didn't say, Bill, let's sign up for bad decisions this week. <laughs> but I learned something through it, all right? Yet, the, yet an individual will say that, well, this was God's plan for my life. Maybe a nurse got saved. And don't you thank God if a nurse got saved? I, I hope some nurses were profoundly affected, and I'm certain they were, as a result of God intervening in Tony and Boulder's lives. I, I, I trust that medical doctors are profoundly affected by the miraculous recovery. Uh, you know, she's, she, she's only had, a, she's got many treatments that would get been out there before her and it, at this point have a clean bill of health. They're, you know, they're thrilled, they're, and they are, how, how grateful we are for that. Then on one hand, we'll say, you know, well, this was God's plan, but then we'll, we'll spend fortunes try to get out of the will of God. Because, see, that's not really what we believe. 
Everything within us wants to resist sickness and disease. Cessation is a doctrine that's very large in the church world today. I rarely do stuff like this. Rarely. All right, now, golly, I'll, 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 I'll pick a tough subject. I rarely will expose a name and a person. All right, now, it doesn't happen very often. On a, on a rare occasion, there would be some. But the, one of the most foremost outspoken critics of those that would believe in laying hands on the sick, praying for the sick, Believing that God is the same yesterday, today, today and forever. Now this gentleman, uh, he's, he's a good Bible teacher. Uh, he's, he's, he's known worldwide, but he's a cessationist. He believes that miracles ended all right, with the apostles. That they were necessary in that day and time. And I will agree that they certainly were an aid and a help to the spreading of the gospel. I would not dis disagree with that. There would be things that I would agree with in this gentleman's life. Things that he'd teach. I, I think if he is teaching on the subject of love, he just does a tremendous job. But when he talks about healing and when he talks about God's intervention in our lives and when he talks about the... You know, maybe, maybe the, the moving of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. Well, he's, he's missed the mark. But yet he's influencing so many. And again, our children, uh, he comes up on their TikTok page. Right? And I'm not a TikTok guy by any stretch of the imagination. But I pay attention to what's being spread around. I watch YouTube, you know. I'm a guy that, you know, I watch, I watch things of interest on YouTube and a lot of things, they, a lot of times they have things to do with, uh, with faith and church history and different subjects. And, and so on my YouTube page, he bounces up all the time. And so I told somebody the other day, they said, why are you going to address it? I said, well, I know that on TikTok and on Instagram, we would have young people seeing this stuff. And I said, and then on YouTube and Facebook, I know adults are seeing this stuff. So here's this gentleman, this gentleman's name is John MacArthur. Again, I believe John MacArthur's a brother. I believe he's a person of faith. I believe John MacArthur loves God. I believe that there, is, there are areas that he is sadly mistaken and as a result would have robbed hope from a person like Tony. I'm gonna give him just a few moments to explain his own position and his own words. And again, did I say that he is my brother? Did I say that I do believe that, it, you know, that he loves Christ? I believe his intentions are well-meaning. But you can be well-meaning in your intentions. And you can do much to discourage the body of Christ. Several years ago, when this is a clip out of his promotion for that, he did a strange fire conference. And this is what the skeptics often do. They find the most flamboyant people that they can. They'll find somebody, you've seen the clips, somebody throw in their coat. Okay, yeah, you've seen it, all right. Just the most flamboyant people out there. And then I end up, and you end up, being identified with them. And so they just make blanket statements. So anyway, here's Pastor John MacArthur in his own words. It's just a minute, you watch it, and then we'll pick back up with the message. We talked about the aberrant charismatic Pentecostal movement that has dominated the evangelical landscape and even spread around the world. Somewhere between half a billion and 750 million people claim to be a part of this movement. And it raised the question of what is called cessationism. Uh, that kind of awkward word simply defines the belief that the New Testament miraculous gifts ceased. They ceased. That has been the normative historical view of the church through the church's life, going all the way back to the New Testament and on into the modern era. But since the turn of the 20th century, there has been the birth of a, 
of a strange uh, Pentecostal and then charismatic movement that wants to affirm that all, all the sign gifts, miraculous gifts are back. I know that wasn't a real smooth transition, but you gotta find a wet place to break it. You get the gist of what he's saying. They do a, they're doing whole seminars now. Uh, they did them in 2023. They will begin again in August of this year. They will go through October. And they do these whole seminars. You know, for $299, you can go to a seminar and learn about doubt and unbelief. <laughs> did I tell you it was $299? I'll tell you the truth today for free. Now, he's very gracious in this. When you listen to him preach, he's not near that gracious. But again, he's my brother. There's many places that we would find agreement in. They do love the word of God. You know? they, be they believe in the inerrancy of it, but sometimes, you know, and I believe in the inerrancy of, of Scripture. If you're a person of faith, you should believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. But sometimes we err in our interpretation of Scripture. Here's one of the Scripture that's cessationist. Cessationists are often Calvinist also, Reformed theology. Listen, and I already said they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, they don't always feel that way about you and I, but I do feel that way about them, and I encourage you to feel the same way. They love Jesus. They often use this verse, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter and verse 8. Love never fails. Don't you believe that? I believe no, love never fails. We're talking about something that is eternal. Always was, always will be. We're not just talking about I love ice cream. We're talking about the love of God. The sacrificial love of God. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, see these are some of these gifts, they will fail. And I, I believe the word, I, that's true. Where there are tongues, they will cease. I, again, I agree. You now now they love this because this is about cessation. And where there is knowledge, it will what? All right. Now this is pretty easy. All right. Uh, I can. I got the. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I got all the books. All the books. I got every book they have. I take picture in my library. I got books. That didn't even count the books that I got on my, my, my computer. I, I can do the study, I can do the word study on any of this in half, all right? But without doing any word study, let me pose to you one question. So they'll say prophecies, what? They fail. Tongues shall what? How about knowledge? Has knowledge vanished away? So you've got to be consistent. You can't just pick out the ones that you don't like. Anything that has any air of being Pentecostal or charismatic, they call, did you hear the word aberrant? Aberrant. Unacceptable. Misapplied. Faulty. Well, knowledge hasn't banished away. I've done this. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. It says, love never what fails. I've circled fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will what? Fail. Now, love never fails. We're all going to agree with that. It's eternal. Right now, we need the Word of God confirmed in our lives. Right now, we need the Spirit of God moving in our lives. And there are times... That there are special gifts. Now, if you don't believe that Tony's received a gift, or if those that are listening online, or our friend, Mr. MacArthur, doesn't believe that Tony's received a gift, you'd be terribly mistaken. That's a new lease on life. Love never fails. Prophecies will fail. I've circled fails. I've circled, it will never fail. I've circled where there are tongues, they will cease. And I've circled, will vanish away. Now they, they jump through all kinds of intellectual hoops. They go to the Greek and they try to explain, you know, how, how knowledge means, knowledge, all right, vanishing away is different than prophecies ceasing. I wrote a letter of thanks this week. 
And I'm, I can be bad, Leon, when I write a letter. Leon would be a great letter writer. Great letter. Peggy Munson is a great letter writer. Uh, Jeff is just excellent, all right? When I write a letter, I write almost just like I talk. It always needs proof, you know, and it, <laughs> you need to help me with some. But, but I know this. Uh, if I'm not careful, I will tend to say the same thing over again. So I was writing a thank you letter. And so I could have said thank you the same way in that letter over and over again. But instead, the first time I said appreciation. The next time I said grateful. And the next time I said thankful. Do any of those words mean anything different? No. They're just nuances. So if we're going to say, and when, when I use prophecies in tongues, but see again in their teachings, and, and, and you heard him say it, the miraculous, the miraculous, the mighty deeds, they ended with the apostles. But again, in those lists, they would take these because they're referred to as charismatic gifts, charisma. And they have flown away. They've passed. They've ended. Oh, but knowledge, the word vanish, is different. It is not different. They're all synonyms. And each one means the same thing. Listen to the listen to Corinthians. Now I'm making a point because again, I got a I got a new a new group of seniors that are going to go off to college. College, you always you can always get a degree in something. You can get a degree in teaching, education, language, arts, history. You can become a doctor, a lawyer. But I'm going to tell you something that usually comes along with it. And it's a degree in atheism. And so it's always my goal to do everything that I can to encourage these young men and women before they go off to college. I, I, listen, I've, I've had phone call after phone call. I've been doing this. This is my 40th year. I've had very few, unless they went to a very solid Christian college, of young people who were not challenged and sometimes their grade threatened over their faith. Again, this is, our challenge is, is it's not only that the church that is challenging whether or not God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but you've got the world challenging it. Listen to this in the Living Bible. I love this translation. All these special gifts and powers. Would you agree that the power of God had to intervene in Tony's life? Yes. And that the power of God was probably made available because of his compassion and the prayers of the saints. Amen. All these special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end. Everybody say someday. someday. That's sometime out in the future, isn't it? And I agree with that. That's what the Bible says. But love goes on forever. Someday, everybody say someday. someday. Prophecies. Speaking in unknown language, tongues. Special knowledge. These gifts. I, now, again, I'm going to interpolate this. I'm going to add this, but I, I, I know this is what they mean when they say this because I have their own words by it. Mighty deeds, the miraculous, divine healing. Now, someday, they will pass away. I believe that. I, I don't never want to argue with the word. It says, one day, these gifts will disappear. Let me tell you when that day is going to be. All right. Let's go to the next verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 9, and 10. 1 Corinthians 13, 9, and 10. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, okay? But when that which is perfect is come, well, hmm, is that a what? Is that a who? Is it a when? I think it is both a who and a when. When that which is perfect is come. Now again, my friends, the cessationists, they love, they love the Lord. They have a personal relationship with Him. I believe they lead people into the kingdom of God. 
but I believe that they do much to discourage people when they're in a difficult moment of life. Accept your suffering. It is the providence. It is the will of God. Now listen, you live by faith and you're going to one day, we're all going to die in faith. Nobody is going to live in this body forever. Isn't that right? In the meantime, we resist until our race is run. We resist sickness, and disease, and death. I've prayed for mothers that had babies. I've prayed for families who needed their dad to be able to get back up and go to work. I never would advocate that, listen, I've, that I've seen everybody we've ever prayed for get, get their answer, get their healing, get their miracle. I know this, my responsibility, our responsibility is to go to the Father and trust Him for what's promised. And then as Tony said, listen, we're, we're, as Boulder said, we're, we're, we're going to love Him and we're going to believe Him irregardless. But our job is to trust Him. I've underlined, but when that which is perfect is come, that is a who. Now, they would say that this ended with the apostles. Then if that's true, then the apostles were perfect, and try selling that. <laughs> I am reminded that Peter cut a man's ear off. I'm reminded that they said, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Right? I, you know, just so many things that we're reminded of when we look at Scripture. Uh, there's dissension between Peter and Paul. They get it right. At the end, in the end, they get it right. Peter takes responsibility for it in the end. You see, they had conflict in, in Galatia. You can read that in the book of Galatians. They were not perfect. There's only one perfect one. Who is that? Thank you. He is gone, but he's do, well, what's going to happen? He's... Thank you. He's coming again. So when that which is perfect is what? Come. Isn't that what it says? That somebody has to come for prophecies to no longer have any value. For these gifts and these expressions to cease. I've not time to, you know, to dive into each and every one of those things. I'm hitting these in the big picture. But the same would be true with mighty deeds. Miracles, the miraculous. For a lack of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just push right on through. Now, this does indicate, all right, when we read, and this, this would be a MacArthur, a cessationist conviction, that these signs and these mighty works are evidence that Paul was an apostle. The word apostle means this, sent by God. I would agree that that's right, that they are an apostle sent by God. But what we do, sometimes we do this in the church world. What we do is we put, we put God in a box because our doctrine is in a box, okay? I agree that many of those signs and wonders certainly did confirm that Paul was an apostle. I believe that. Is that my next? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Let's just... Uh, No. I'm looking for my verse. I'll get to it in a second. So I do believe that, once again, that it confirms that Paul was an apostle, one that was sent by God. All right? Signs and wonders, the things that God does often, all right, would reveal, like in Jesus' life. Look what Jesus said in John 14, 11. Believe me what I say. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or what? Okay. So they're really struggling with this. You understand that Jesus was the very first person to ever call God his Father. It had never happened before. Never happened before. But he's calling God his Father. We call God Father as a result of being the children of God. Okay? Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So the miracles that took place in his life 
certainly added credibility to the statements that he made that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I only do what the Father says. I only say what I hear him speak. So this lends credibility to the, to the claims, to the statements. It certainly does prove his, his messianic calling upon his life, that he is the redeemer of Israel, but he's not just the redeemer of Israel. He's the son of God. See, you can fulfill, you, you, there can be more than one purpose fulfilled in God doing something. You know, we go to work. I go to work. You go to work. We all, we're earning a living. And you know, one of the reasons we try to earn a living is so that we can put food on the table. But sometimes we go to work so that we can take our family on vacation. Oh, it's the same job, but it's a different reason. And sometimes we go to work and we're very diligent. We take that money and we set it aside for the future. It's the same job, it's the same resources, but it's different purposes. So the same is true that when we're talking about God being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, you may not believe upon me based upon my word, but why don't you believe upon me at least for the miracles themselves that you see? See, the cessationist reasoning is this. The MacArthur's of the world. When the apostles passed... The miraculous gifts passed with them. They were gone. They were no longer necessary. This is their truth. This is their thought. Now, mind you, I, I would be honest concerning their convictions. I will not add to theirs. And sometimes it, it's done on our behalf. Again, they'll use the most flam, flamboyant, extraordinary, dramatic charismatic or Pentecostal or third waiver or whatever to make their points. And then we are all identified by their maybe extreme behavior on occasions. But again, the claim that these things just, they just passed away. Well, I will say this, that science from the, from the beginning of time, well, go, go to the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. Signs and wonders Healings have always served as supernatural advertisement. Has always served as supernatural advertisement. See, the miraculous is God showing himself alive by many infallible proofs. Jesus being raised from the dead was a miraculous thing, and he showed himself alive. That was one of the infallible proofs. Another one of his infallible proofs was he's walking on the road with two men to, a, to the town of Emmaus, and on their way, he stops, he eats with them, and all of a sudden, he disappears. That was miraculous. He walked through the room when they were, they were in the room hiding from the Romans. He showed himself alive. But, but listen, I tell you that a testimony like that was shared today is the same as Acts 1-3. It's God showing himself alive by many infallible proofs. MacArthur claims that the belief of cessation of the, the gifts has been the norm, the norm, from the New Testament through the modern era. That's a quote from that video. From the New Testament to the modern era. This is a norm, but that's not true. It was not the norm. Because if it was true, once the apostles died, the perfect ones... But then if they, those that don't believe that believe this. They believe that when that which is perfect was come. They believed when we got the modern canonization of Scripture, then that which was perfect has come. But it's, it's talking about a person. It shall come to pass. So again, I would say that that's just absolutely, it's not true. It was not the norm. This is on the screen. You may not be able to read all of this. This is just one person. This is Augustine. This is their guy. Augustine, the, uh, Augustine was uh, uh, John Calvin's 
was the guy he read after the most, was the guy he studied after the most. Uh, Calvinism, Reformed theology, has its roots in Augustine of Hippo. He lived from 354 to 430 AD. So we're talking about well over 200 to 300 years after the last apostle has died. He wrote in his book, now you've got to know this about Augustine, Augustine starts out as a skeptic because Augustine is an intellectual. Now listen, we should thank God for people who are intellectuals. We should thank God for people who have studied the scripture and know the language. Okay, we should. He was an intellectual, he was a brilliant person, a brilliant mind. And in his writing, The City of God, in book 22, and did I tell you book 22? <laughs> Chapter 8 says, the miracle which was wrought in Milan was there. He started out as a skeptic, but these things begin to happen. The miracle which was wrought in Milan was there, by which a blind man was restored to sight and could come to the knowledge of many. For not only the city, a large one, all right, the whole city of Milan knew about this blind man getting healed, but also the emperor was there and knew about it at that time. Now, he continues. You understand this is a whole chapter, a whole chapter on these supernatural, powerful things that God's doing. He tells of a man on his deathbed that was healed. He tells of a woman in Carthage who was healed from breast cancer. He described how they often would have to sever their breast. And then he continues and he identifies 70 different miraculous happenings and healings in the city of God in the 22nd book in chapter 8. Again, the secessionist says that these, that these gifts, that these miraculous things, these divine interventions, that it has been the norm that they've ceased from the death of the apostles into the modern era. And that it's just a latter time invention and false doctrine of Charismatics and Pentecostals. Augustine, probably the most famous church father. But I could go on, I could tell you that uh, 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 Origen, Tertullian, Polycarp, they, for many people they don't mean anybody, but you've heard of Polycarp, most of you have. Superion, monks living in monasteries. Here's a good, here, here's a good one, all right? There's an article online, Miracles Didn't Stop in the First Century, and it was written by Matt Dabbs. And he just goes by and he just identifies some of these things. Now, here's my point. People who are sick, afflicted, desperate, maybe in some other, in some other way. Maybe they need a financial miracle. Maybe there's a, it's a family so broken it could never be put back together. But when you tell people that the miraculous and the mighty deeds are over, what do they believe? What, what is their faith attached to? I believe this. I've said this many times as a pastor. You always get what you preach. Stay with me for a minute. Over the years, I've said this. Well, if you go to church here, you know this. I, I've said, how many times have I said, Ray, the biggest problem people have is unforgiveness, right? Yep. If I preach on forgiveness, do you know what happens every time? Because somebody forgives. You know what? Because God confirms this word. You know, when you preach salvation, you know what happens? Oh, somebody gets saved, right? Right? And if you pray about strengthening marriages, you know what usually happens? Marriages get strengthened. You, because faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the. But what if we never preach on the miraculous? Thank you. See, the math's pretty easy. Great article, Matt Dobbs. Listen, there's whole books written on this subject. So I, 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 I hate to be, 
Let's, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. When I was there, I, I certainly gave you every proof. I was truly an apostle. He says, so proofs were left. I was sent to you by God himself. For I waited patiently. I did many what? Wonders, signs, and mighty works. Now, I think that the miraculous is always that. And this certainly does say that Paul was an apostle, one sent by God. I, I agree with what they say. But here's the challenge. When you limit it just to happening to, in that time to those people, then you have to question, then is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Again, this cessationists believe these, these gifts. And again, they, 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 if you go on, their videos are so well made. I'm telling you, you know, when you look at their videos, they got that warm look, good film quality. Well done. I'm, I'm not making fun of them. Well done. Lighting is great. You know, we're poor. We have, now, I don't, I, forgive me, Lord. But we're just a rural church. Our lighting is marginal. It's the very best video quality we can do. All right? I listen, but, you know. We don't have a $12,000 camera. We don't have a studio. I'm telling you, they make good videos. And I like for the church to do things well. I believe in it. I applaud them for doing it well. But if you're not careful, you'll get wowed by the well. And somebody might rob you of your hope. Again, he's one of the foremost spokesmen for Christianity. Thank God for all the things we agree on. But in this, era, in this area, a great disservice is done to the body of Christ. The cessationists believe that these gifts were exclusively an exclusivity. See, there are some exclusive things in the, in, in the Word of God. There is only one Messiah. It's exclusive. Confucius didn't know the way to God. Buddha don't know the way to God. Muhammad doesn't know the way to God. You said, well, Bill, you shouldn't say that. I, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is an exclusive statement. All right? I do believe that there's exclusivity in the Scripture. I don't believe that it's true concerning these signs. I don't believe that the Scripture bears that out. They believe that it was just exclusively for confirming their apostolic call upon their lives. Now, let me show you something. Mark the 16th chapter. Mark the 16th chapter, verses 17 and 18. And these signs will follow those who what? I've underlined that. These signs will follow who? Those who believe. Does it say that these signs will follow those who are apostles? But it would include them, wouldn't it? It wouldn't exclude them. But it doesn't exclude you. Listen. Listen. Collectively, many people prayed for Tony. We had a man one time in our church. He'd fallen off the Alaskan pipeline working on it. He got a huge settlement out of it. His knee was locked. It was solid. It was the most extraordinary thing that I... Well, no, not the most, but way up there. Again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting these things happen every day, but thank God they happen. This guy was... You know, he, had, he just... It was all... Pinned and it was, you know, it was like this. And when, he, and when he sat down, he had put his leg like this. I'm telling you, a housewife, a housewife. She didn't know any better. A housewife. Love God. Believe God. I, she said, I'm just going to pray for you. And she did. And his knee bent. And his knee bent. And in his case, if you go to the doctor, oh, the metal's still there. And, and, and he would bend his knee, and they said, that's not right. He says, it, it, it works. He says, it does. Now, that, was that extraordinary? You bet. Did that say that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Was, was that supernatural advertisement that God is still concerned about the affairs and the concerns and the difficulties of mankind? Yes, it did. 
He said, and these signs will follow them that believe that in my name they'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will what? Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Is the word apostle there anywhere? Now it doesn't exclude them though. I do believe that the apostolic calling upon Paul's life was confirmed by many mighty deeds that was done through his life and ministry. I believe that, but it doesn't exclude you. And thank God that it didn't die when Paul or John the Elder passed away. Otherwise, we might not be here today celebrating the miraculous things taking place in Tony's life. In Acts, the 8th chapter, verses 5 and 7, said, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord gave heed unto those things that Philip spake. Does anybody know what Philip is? Nope. Acts, the 6th chapter. What is he? Thank you! He's a what? He's a deacon. He's not an apostle. Well, then maybe this is not legitimate. Maybe this shouldn't have happened. But he went down to their city and, and they gave heed, seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were what? Healed. 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 So you have believers. You have one who is... A deacon. Now you can make the case that later in the book of Acts that he's referred to as Philip the Evangelist. But he goes down to Samaria as a deacon in a local church and tells them about Jesus. And God confirms his word. Isn't that tremendous? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? 2 Timothy 3, 7. There are those that are ever learning, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We must be careful. See, the doctrine of, or the belief in cessation, it finds its roots in the era of enlightenment of David Hume. Go home and look up David Hume. David Hume had a tremendous influence on some of our founding fathers, one of them being Thomas Jefferson. Do you know that there's a Bible referred to as the Jefferson Bible? Do you know that? Anybody ever hear, ever hear of the Jefferson Bible? Raise your hand. All right, there's a few. You know what, you know what the Jefferson Bible was? He went in and he, took, he, 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 took, and he cut out all the miracles because Jefferson was influenced by David Hume. The secessionist roots are attached to the Enlightenment that was so greatly influenced by David Hume. Now the cessationist, and in this case, our, our, our friend, they are the ignorant of church history. I, I'm being pretty strong right now, and I know it. I'm not trying to be divisive, but listen. You know, a year from now, we'll be, we may be praying for someone else. I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust not, but maybe a year from now, maybe it's you that we're standing in the gap for. And I don't need this big smiling face coming on, on the screen and you believing that these things passed away with the apostles. So again, he says that this is the norm, but it wasn't the norm. I, I, I showed you what Augustine of Hippo said, and I could have showed you 50 other instances. Cessationists are either ignorant of church history or they're not being honest about it. Cessationists do this. This is my great concern as a pastor. Who knows that in his life that he's still going to have to go to the hospital and he's still going to have to go to a home and pray for somebody. Encourage them. The cessationist robs God's people of hope and strips God of his compassion. I close with these. Hope deferred. Hope deferred. It means postponed, delayed, put off. What's it cause the heart to do? 
be sick. So if I tell you that the mighty deeds and the miraculous and healings and the, and the moving of the Spirit of God in someone's life to, to, to bring God's best to them, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the enemy. But if we tell you that that's ended, where does hope go? It's postponed, it's delayed, it's put off, and the heart is sick. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 32, again, I tell you that many times God is not just showing that he's God, and he does. He's not just showing that he's all-powerful and, and, uh, and he's all-knowing. And he does. And he is. But you know, he's a father. And he's compassionate. God is not always showing off. Of course, I'd say he never shows off. But he's not just advertising who he is. He's not just out to prove something. Many of the things that God does is just because He loves us. I believe that God loves Tony McKinney. Now Jesus called His disciples to Himself and said, I have compassion on the multitudes. Because they've now continued with me three days. They've nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry. At least they faint on the way. The miracles of the loaves and fishes were produced... Not to prove that he was the Son of God. It was not produced because he wanted to show them that he was the Messiah. The loaves and fishes came about because of his compassion, his love for the multitude. The blind man said, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. One translation said, Lord Jesus, have compassion on me. These things were not just, just, exclusively on display to prove who God is. And thank God, I'm for that. But I'm, I'm, I'm humbled, and my heart is warmed, and my faith is encouraged knowing that God does it because He loves us. We do not want to rob people of hope. We do not want to strip God of his compassion. See, we're calling this following God through chaos, conflict, and confusion. There's a lot of confusion concerning this. Great communicators, but they're still confused. You can follow God through tragedy and trials, and you can know that he can and he cares. Every head bowed, no one looking around. You might be here this morning and maybe you've never made a decision concerning the person of Christ. We would like to give you an opportunity to make a decision. We're saying that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, Jesus was saving in his life. He was saving in the book of Acts, and he has continued to save until this day. Why? Because he is the same yesterday today, and forever. You may have never made a decision concerning the person of Christ, but we'd like to help you bring you to that point of decision. Only Jesus can save somebody. Now let me be very clear. You could be a guest here, and I'm not asking you to join our church. I think that's a great thing, but that's not our question this morning. We're not asking you if you've ever been baptized, and we believe in that. We had baptism last Sunday. We're not asking you if you got a Sunday school pin or if grandma and grandpa were Christians. We're asking you, have you ever asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? Every Sunday I tell people, everybody wants a Savior. But salvation does not come without Lordship. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Jesus wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants everything. He'll take your sin, and he does. He died for it. He'll take your hurt, your habit, your pain. But he wants your heart. He wants your gifts, your life, your talents. He wants, he wants to be the Lord of your life. Will you call Jesus the Lord of your life? 
We're going to pray and we're going to invite everyone to pray with us. The Bible says we can pray one for another. You could be listening online and we would like for you to pray with us. Have you ever asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? I pose these very simple but very important questions. You do have to be able to believe. For as many that believe upon him, John's gospel. For as many that believe upon him, to them he's given the power to become the sons of God. You do have to believe some things. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's own son? And you know, most people would say, yeah, listen, I have no reason not to believe that. I'd say that's good. Doesn't mean you're saved, but that is good. Now, you, you may be saved and believe that, but just believing that doesn't save you. Do you believe that he lived a sinless life? And you'd say, well, gosh, that's what I've been told. I have no reason to doubt it. And I'd say, good. Do you believe he suffered for you and that he died on the cross, that he was punished for you? You'd say, yeah, you know, I, that's one of the reasons I celebrate Easter is I believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And I'd say, but that's really good. In that we mentioned, do you believe that he was raised from the dead? This is essential to be saved. If you can believe those things, you could be saved. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've got to call upon his name. You've got to, by invitation, ask Jesus to come into your life. Would you make him the Lord of your life? We're going to pray. Again, if you're listening online, would you pray with us also? You may have wandered in your faith and said, Bill, I've, I, yes, I've, I know Jesus, but I've kind of wandered in my faith and I, he's no longer in charge. I'm in charge. But this morning, I'm, I'm really convicted and I, I would like to reaffirm my faith this morning. And I'd say, good. So maybe you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. Second of all, maybe you've wandered in your faith. Would you just pray and affirm that faith in him once again? Call upon his name. Everybody's going to pray. The Bible says we pray one for another. Let's do this. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. I believe that He died. I believe He died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord is my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Jesus, you're my Lord. God, you're my Father. Thank you for saving me now. Amen. For just another moment, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I just want to know who we prayed with and for. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Bill, every head bowed, no one's looking around. You say, when you prayed this morning, I prayed also. One, maybe you wandered in your faith. Two, maybe you've just never fully trusted in him before. If that's you, let's look up real quickly. Let's wait for our eyes to meet. Again, I'm not going to do anything that makes you feel awkward or uncomfortable. Just want to know who we prayed with and for. Thank you. Father, you look down from heaven, you see more than our eyes, you see our hearts. You see the decisions and the commitments that people have made. I pray, Father, that peace would come into their hearts. It could be those listening online, Father. I believe that they'll know that they're forgiven, loved and accepted. They have fully trusted your Son as their Lord and as their Savior. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for giving them a brand new heart. God, we ask these things and we're grateful for them. In Jesus' precious name, amen.